Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Murray. I'm the instructor for the course EU and US climate change mitigation here at the University of Economics and Business in the summer semester of 2024. And for today's session, we have the privilege of hearing from someone who I consider perhaps among the top 10 climate activists globally. <laughs> From my point of view, uh, Warren Levy, who, uh, Levy, who has had a very, very, very strong uh, career as a lawyer in the Chicagoland area, and who moved to the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois about a decade ago, where he has been teaching and advising in various departments, also at the federal, state, and local levels. Uh, he and I had an opportunity to meet uh, roughly two years ago, and we haven't looked back since. We are going to uh, collaborate together. Also, the students in this class, in the class Warren Levy is teaching. And before he begins speaking today, he has asked that we introduce ourselves. And I'm going to ask our excellent assistant for the course, Felix Ambrose, to operate the camera manually and move it around the classroom now as we start in the back with Herr Bettstein. Bettstein, I am studying at the Bingo, the University of Economics and Business now in my eighth semester, in the final semester. I'm working on my bachelor's degree in business and economics. Thank you. We'll keep it short, and that was a good start. Now we'll move on to Italy. Uh, hi, I'm Patricia Bianchi, and I study here as an Erasmus student for six months. Uh, I come from Rome, Italy, and I study law in, in Italy, Rome, and here I study business law. And to Austria? Uh, yes, I'm Patricia Campo. I am also studying here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. Uh, so I'm a business, economics, and social science student. All right. And now back to this side, we go to North Macedonia. Yeah. Uh, I'm Berce Gergievska. I'm coming from North Macedonia, but I'm studying here in Vienna, University of Economics and Business. And I'm also finishing my bachelor this semester, hopefully. Okay. And now to a group of University of Illinois students. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm studying at the University of Illinois, but I'm on exchange here in Vienna for one semester. Um, I'm studying accounting with a minor in sustainability. Hello, my name is Deporva. I'm also studying at University of Illinois, and I'm here for an engineering semester, and I'm studying computer science with a minor in sociology. Um, my name is Julia Stab. I'm also a student at the University of Illinois, um, and I'm here doing the same semester, and I'm studying construction management. Um, same for me from Illinois, studying this semester. Um, I am studying communications within my own business. My name is Eileen Olson. My name is Elena Ben Olson from Illinois, I'm studying and I'm studying supply chain management. Supply chain management. Okay. We also have two guests. And I would like each of them to introduce themselves. Let's start in the back row. My name is and I work in a pharmaceutical company as the head of strategic procurement. And uh, yeah, I can tell you know a lot of my uh, work fields. Um, I I have to do with uh, a lot of the acronyms, for example, the GDP or the SDPI, uh, and also the scope uh, three. And the part of my job to uh, engage and encourage suppliers to be a mission so that we also ask to be more. Thank you. 
on the Hill. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ariadne Montefala. I'm the Illinois Indiana Programs Director. Um, I, I'm very happy that we all be here in this room together. Um, thanks to Bruce and Felix and also Warren. Hi, uh, it's good to see you again. Um, we could uh, start this course and um, it's part of a, of a larger program, the Global Sustainability Certificate Program. Some of you participate in that too. And uh, I think uh, all of us, uh, Bruce, Felix, uh, Warren, uh, and I are trying to increase the academic offerings, academic and fractional offerings in the field of sustainability for students here and there. And that's what reminds us. Thanks. All right, we move on to the front row and on to Hungary. So we so my name is Marto. I study at uh, Vienna University of Economics and Business, and I do business law. Hi, I'm Bobby. I'm also from Hungary. I'm studying at the University of Vienna, focusing on doing my master's in sustainability and global change. Finally, back to Austria. Thank you very much. We were able to do that in five minutes. And now, uh, Warren, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, uh, Bruce, thank you so much for the introduction. And to all you students, thank you for introducing yourselves. Uh, you're very fortunate to be studying at uh, uh, VEU uh, and to be part of this wonderful course. Um, I had the privilege of teaching there last May, and I, I enjoyed it. And the, the best part of it was the students and getting to learn a little bit about their lives, their interests, their uh, ideas. So uh, thank you for spending the time with me and giving me this opportunity. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Um, okay, how does that look? Looks, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, Many months ago, Bruce asked me to uh, speak today on uh, some you know, climate litigation issues, and uh, you know he characterized me uh, as being a very uh, influential uh, environmental activist. Uh, I'm not going to take credit for the development today, uh, where the European Court on Human Rights, you know, issued a landmark decision. Uh, in favor of uh, elderly women, you know, saying that uh, Switzerland was not doing enough in uh, mitigating climate change uh, to and and thereby violated their fundamental rights to health and uh, well-being. Uh, we'll have to uh, dig into this case, uh, find out a little bit more about its implications, but certainly it sets the tone for this discussion, you know, that uh, many different groups around the world are seeking uh, court decisions to help address uh, the grave harms from climate change to their health and well-being. Uh, courts are not an answer for everyone, and you know, we uh, found out about that again uh, in the same ruling you know, where the European Court of Human Rights tossed out a case you know, brought by young people in Portugal against 32 nations, you know, where uh, the court held that uh, the children didn't have the ability to bring a case against 32 countries, given that they didn't live in all 32 countries. Um, in many ways, courts are seeking uh, pathways not to decide uh, these difficult climate changes. Another decision today by the European Court of Human Rights tossed out a case by uh, the mayor of a, a French town against France, again seeking a declaration that the, the nation wasn't doing enough on climate change. Uh, so let me just welcome you to this uh, discussion uh, by you know, taking two photos from uh, our campus uh, sustainability uh, manuals. Uh, the one on the left is from the VEU sustainability report, 
And the one on the right is from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign Climate Action Plan. And um, I think of these as, uh, in, in a way, you know, showing that we're all in this together, uh, that, you know, bicycling is, you know, an environmentally um, uh, friendly way of transportation and, you know, also a healthy activity. But in a way, I think of these photos as terribly insulting and misleading for uh, the students uh, on both campuses. And um, just wondering if one of the students from VEU uh, could, you know, maybe, you know, talk about this a little bit, you know, your reaction to this photo or both the photos and maybe one student from Illinois. Um, my initial was that both of the photos kind of were drastically different vibes of how it feels to be biking on campus. The one on the left seems a little bit more happy. Um, but also I noticed that there's nobody else around in either pictures, which is very unrealistic for being on a college campus or university campus. Okay, great. That and, was a uh, perspective. We have someone with a perspective from Austria, from the very room. Remember, if we say nothing, that's bad. If we say something and it's wrong, that's good. If we say something and it's right, that's the best. Here, there's no right or wrong. So if you say something, that is the best. So yes. Maybe what I would uh, um incorrect person to the to picture that I would probably criticize uh, with the way you won is that meanwhile it's for sure a lot does a lot better job in selling this this lifestyle of uh, uh, like being um, the bicycle at uni um, doing it happily and, and all that however I feel like it's it is um, kind of a small proportion of the picture that actually like portrays that the person is biking so you can see the steering uh, wheel Below, but it's it's uh, very very rather subtle, I would say, in comparison to the other picture. All right. So thank you to both students. Uh, I thought those were great comments. And what disturbs me is yes, these students are alone, and somehow this is an image of an environmentally conscious student. Uh, choosing to ride a bike rather than say you know own a uh, uh, fuel uh, fueled car and and drive it around and such, but you're absolutely right. The, it takes collective action. It takes getting involved. It's not enough for us to find a quiet pathway, yeah, you know, and uh, uh, ride along it, yeah, you know, because the way that we're going, you know, th these. Uh, trees, you know, that are are you know evident in both pictures. You know, the air, you know, that's healthy enough enough to for us to have exercise outdoors and you know cool enough temperatures. You know, are uh, fading, uh, and uh, we need to be involved with climate change policies, with collective actions, with you know talking to other people to try to influence their behaviors. You know, going beyond finding you know a quiet path and, and bicycling off. So it's in that spirit that you know I you know kind of will present uh, these three topics. Uh, you know where people your age uh, get involved in court cases uh, and also in activities to try to. Uh, take away investments from fossil fuel companies. So the, the context is that uh, in Europe, there's a very comprehensive uh, approach to the future. You know, part of it is driven by climate change, but part by other concerns about equity and about uh, other forms of uh, pollution and about health uh, 
you know, transforming you know the the whole economy to be a sustainable future. And uh, this has been a process that has gone through uh, a wide range of expert panels and the political processes at at the EU, you know, to come up with a uh, you know, a whole package, a balance, a set of of interrelated actions. You know, so why would uh, people who are concerned about climate change, you know, decide to go to a court and get a court involved in, you know, trying to address one issue, you know, where there's such a, a large, you could think of it as an ecosystem of sustainability challenges and actions, you know, that, um, you know, now, uh, Fit for 55 has been adopted at the EU level. Nations are uh, implementing it. You know, there's a you know a legislative approach, and you know I'll I'll start with um, the U.S. where you know there's a mix of constitutional uh, provisions uh, that. Um, some groups are seeking the courts to address in the context of human rights and climate change. So uh, in Illinois, uh, we have a new constitution from 1970. It's not new that long. I remember when it was adopted. You don't. Uh, but, um, you know, it was adopted at a time when the environmental movement was first finding a lot of traction in the United States. And we have provisions in the Illinois Constitution, you know, with regard to a healthful environment for the benefit of uh, this and, and other generations. And, you know, it's the obligation of the legislature, the General Assembly, to provide for a healthful environment and laws. And also uh, individuals have a right under this constitutional provision to file litigation. Well, you know, Illinois is, is experiencing you know, record uh, temperatures. Uh, last summer, uh, we had the world's worst air quality for two days in June because uh, particulate matter from the wildfires that were burning in Canada was blowing into Illinois uh, hundreds of miles away, but you know, we were suffering. So uh, Illinois did not enjoy a healthful environment uh, for those days and, and many other days. And, and many people in Illinois live in neighborhoods that are suffering uh, industrial pollution or pollution from automobiles or uh, unhealthy water, whether it's lead in the pipes or not enough um, uh, proper clean water treatment and such. So it it's this mix of legal rights and uh, challenges, you know, that some people are taking uh, you know, to um, courts as well as legislatures. Now, you know, on, on the federal level in the United States, you know, the Constitution is much older, uh, 1787. Uh, people weren't talking about uh, environmental protections you know, at that time, uh, there there really wasn't, you know, a notion of a right to a healthful environment. Uh, and yet uh, there's, you know, a high, high profile cases that uh, have been based on the U.S. Constitution. So the the provision that environmental advocates have, have used is the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution in the what we call the Bill of Rights, that the government must use due process in taking life, liberty, or property. And, um, you know, it's creative lawyering. What does this have to do with climate change, right? Well, uh, a, uh, a group, you know, called Our Children's Trust uh, filed a case going back, you know, about a decade now, you know, where a district court in uh, Portland you know, the, the judge was favorable to the case and said that, you know, you, this should go to trial. And the judge you know, said, you know, exercising my reasoned judgment, 
I have no doubt that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society. That is, she was willing to look at you know, these obligations of the government you know, with regard to life, liberty, or property and say that uh, people your age you know, should not be subject to floods and uh, forced, uh, well, forced to flee because of wildfires or you know, forced to stay inside because of heat waves and higher uh, pollen counts and, and you know, the, the other uh, manifestations of climate change. Well, you know, this decision was reversed by the, um, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and went up to the Supreme Court a couple of times. And uh, the, the, the appellate court said, you know, this is just too much to ask uh, a, you know, the courts to do, right? You know, that uh, you know, it's beyond the judiciary's power. Go to Congress. You know, um, we, we, we're not going to get the courts in that position. So uh, the group, uh, Our Children's Trust, refiled this case and it says, all right, you know, court, you know, we're not asking you for a comprehensive plan, you know, that would uh, mandate the, the government to follow, you know, uh, an approach to reducing greenhouse gases and providing for uh, care adaptation for those suffering from climate change. You know, instead, you know, issue a declaration, you know, that, uh, you know, we have constitutional rights in this area, a right to live under a stable uh, climate system. And, you know, we'll be happy with that. So, you know, that case is still pending. Now, uh, there was a very uh, hyped, uh, you know, decision uh, last summer in Montana. Have anybody... You know, has anybody in the classroom heard about this decision? You know, I'm seeing head shake no. Bruce, anybody say yes? I say yes. Think you do? Not. Yes. Okay. <laughs> do you want to tell the class about it? <laughs> um, it was coming to Clark at the time when the forest fires were raging in the West. And uh, in the summer, I think it was in June of 2023, there was a decision. And again, it's important to note, it was a group of young people who brought the case and they did find pretty explicit language in the constitution of the state of Montana for their argument. All right, yeah, very good. So my take on it is a little bit different, but yeah, yes, that's that's the essence of it. So, you know, in the, the Montana Constitution, there's a right to a clean and healthful environment, uh, much like the language from the Illinois Constitution. So the decision in uh, last summer, uh, there was a, um, a series of laws passed by the legislature in Montana, uh, the Environmental Protection Act, that you know, provided the basis for granting permits uh, to activities like mining coal, you know, which is a huge activity in Montana, or burning coal to generate electricity. And the Environmental Protection Act prohibited the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions and climate impacts, you know, because those are really of a global nature. And the law said only look at the Montana specific impacts. So what the court held here was that that law violated the constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment, you know, because uh, what happens in Montana, like mining coal, does have an impact on the global climate system, but it comes back to affect the health and well-being of people in Montana. You know, people in Montana are suffering from uh, worse health problems, both physical and mental health, uh, as well as um, uh, threats to uh, their, their, their property, you know, from uh, uh, wildfires or from floods and, and such. But uh, medical uh, testimony in this case was really critical, you know, saying that young people are living in an uh, environment that is becoming less healthful 
you know, because of the activities that uh, contribute to climate change. And Montana has a significant role in that so that its environmental permits should consider it. Now, uh, anybody recognize you know, what this is portraying? So about uh, 10 years ago, uh, this was really the center of climate litigation uh, in the United States. Uh, this is uh, the town of Kivalina in Alaska. And the picture on, the, on my left, the one that, that shows the ice, uh, is the way that the village had been for hundreds of years. So it's uh, Native Americans uh, who you know, settled here and their, uh, their village was protected by uh, ice surrounding it. They uh, you know, went out and you know, did their hunting, uh, walruses and other things, you know, you know, on the ice. And um, the sea, you know, was, you know, part of their, their lives and, and they were really, you know, uh, at one in, with it. They're, they're, uh, uh, but, you know, with climate change, you know, the seas have warmed and uh, you know, now uh, the uh, storms and continuing sea level rise, you know, are affecting the ability of, of the village to survive uh yeah with flooding yeah but also in terms of access to uh, you know, all of the um, the fishing and and uh, hunting that was uh, based on ice so in 2012 uh representatives of this native village you know sued you know uh, major fossil fuel companies claiming that you know the the fuel companies are responsible for a big portion of climate change and they should, you know, help fund the, the millions of dollars it'll take to build seawalls around the village and, and ultimately to evacuate this area because, you know, the seas continue to rise. Um, but the courts, you know, held that uh, the, this case, you know, could not go forward that, you know, there's a uh, uh, principle of preemption. You know, the, the case was filed in federal courts and uh, the, the court uh, found that, you know, at the federal level, Congress had adopted uh, the Clean Air Act of 1970 and that that meant that any claim uh, for harms based on polluting the air or emitting greenhouse gases you know, had to go to the Environmental Protection Agency and was subject to the regulations that were adopted there. Um, so, you know, a lot of the litigation has a very tough road. Uh, but uh, the, the claims against the fossil fuel companies continue. You know, they continue because they're being filed in state court. So since that 2012 decision, uh, a number of different uh, states, uh, municipalities, and uh, counties, uh, uh, other groups have filed claims against the fossil fuel companies, you know, claiming that uh, you know, there was deception, that, they, that the companies knew, you know, that their activities, their products, you know, were harmful, and that the companies should have to pay for damages. And this went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, well, you know, the, the state court claim should continue. It's not preempted by uh, the Clean Air Act and, and the federal level. Um, in fact, you know, Chicago just jumped into this uh, less than two months ago. It filed a claim against uh, oil companies. And, you know, Chicago is, uh, has different kinds of damages than, you know, some uh, coastal cities, but nevertheless is feeling harmed from uh, the effects of climate change. So, you know, the mayor of Chicago said this, you know, about the consequences of climate change, you know, whether it's heat or flooding. And, you know, the, the city has to pay for 
uh, greater stormwater treatment uh, facilities because of intense rains, more um, cooling centers during heat waves. Uh, there are real costs here, as well as you know, the uh, uh, decrease in quality of life for Chicago residents. Uh, but you know, uh, the industry group for the fossil fuel companies, American Petroleum Institute, said this, you know, that uh, it's, it's just another lawsuit. Uh, everybody knows that our products are essential to the lives and well-being of Americans. They depend on energy, uh, whether it's electricity or fuel for their, their vehicles. And uh, instead of paying, you know, spending taxpayer money for um you know, these lawsuits, you know, let's uh, have uh, better uh, actions implemented uh, you know, by these cities. And, you know, if you got a problem, you know, go to the legislature. Um, so it's not just the fossil fuel companies. They are a big contributor. This is, you know, a meat processing company. Um, and in New York, uh, there is a case filed by the attorney general against this company, and it alleges that the company has also been you know, deceptive on its connection to greenhouse gases. Um, and it says that uh, this kind of deception is uh, leading more consumers to eat beef, you know, that it provides environmentally conscious consumers with a license to eat beef because they think that they're getting products from a company that cares about the environment and is taking uh, actions to reduce uh, its greenhouse gas emissions. But this case is pending. So, you know, that kind of wraps up my quick review of some of the U.S. litigation. But, you know, let's go back to where I started with today's development at the European Convention on Human Rights. So here's, you know, the provision of the uh, convention. Uh, here's another provision that, you know, is being used by the litigants. And the, the first such uh, successful case was in 2019. Uh, this was a case brought uh, in uh, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, but it made uh, claims under uh, the European Convention on Human Rights as well as uh, Netherlands law. And that court said that uh, the, the nation must act uh, faster uh, in, in implementing its duty of care uh, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, uh, you know, big celebration. They won in 2019, but, you know, there's, there's ongoing efforts to uh, get the, the Netherlands as well as other countries to uh, act faster. And here's the case that was uh, decided uh, today, uh, brought by 2,000 mostly elderly women. Uh, they claim that they're particularly susceptible to the health impacts of climate change it's heat, air quality, and such. You know, just like the youth are particularly sensible, sensitive to um, adverse health impacts from climate change. So in 2013, they filed the case, and you know, health problems, and you know, just got the uh, strong result today. Uh, you know, here's another case in Europe uh, that has you know gotten a lot of attention in Ireland. Um, specifically under, uh, you know, looking at uh, legislation, you know, that required uh, the nation to adopt plans to transition to a low carbon uh, climate resilient economy. And uh, a group, the Friends of the Irish Environment, uh, uh, filed a case in, in court saying that uh, the plan that was adopted by uh, the government did not comply with the standard in the law, not sufficiently specific for the whole period. It's not enough to just say, all right, by 2050, we'll get there. You know, if uh, you, know, you need to set interim milestones and reporting and, and, and actions. Um, so, you know, this is what's happened since that case. Now, uh, litigation in France as well. Uh, here's, 
you know, an article under you know, the Charter of the Environment in France, another article that's been applicable to uh, climate litigation. And, you know, here's a, a case you know, decided in 2021, you know, that ordered France to comply with commitments and to achieve a catch up, you know, that it wasn't moving fast enough to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in Germany, you know, just, you know, give you, you know, some sense. So, you know, provisions under the basic law, uh, decision in uh, German courts from 2021, you know, that um, it, the, the government's plan and actions have to move faster. It's not enough to say, all right, in future generations, you know, we'll get to some target. You know, in fact, we have to, you know, start making those investments, making those changes in conduct now. And, you know, even, you know, with the victory in 2021, you know, it, uh, groups went back to the courts and, and got a decision in 2023, you know, that there still wasn't sufficient action. So, you know, like that U.S. or that series of U.S. cases against fossil fuel companies, uh, there's, you know, various, uh, you know, actions, uh, you know, in Europe against fossil fuel companies. Here's one, you know, against Shell uh, that is, you know, got headlines again, you know, this past week, you know, as the appeal was filed, you know, here the, the, the Dutch courts ruled against Shell. You know, Shell went to the court and said, well, look, you can impose whatever you want on us, but it's not really going to help uh, the, uh, the global climate. You know, if, if we have to suffer, you know, additional costs of uh, changing our operations and our products, you know, people will just go to low cost suppliers of fossil fuels and other companies. And um, it's... Uh, you know, it's counterproductive to uh, put uh, burdens on us. Uh, the French court, you know, also dealt with this. So, you know, here's that um, uh, appellate argument by Shell that, you know, just came up last week. Uh, so uh, that kind of wraps up my review of U.S. and uh, European uh, climate litigation. I'm just going to go quickly because I really want to hear from you, but, you know, just kind of set the stage for the second half of your class today, you know, about uh, divestment actions. And, and, you know, I started off with the photos of the bicyclists, you know, and the similarity between Bellu and uh, Illinois. And here, the universities are in a different position. Uh, you know, the University of Illinois, you know, while, um, getting funding from the uh, state government, you know, has an endowment uh, that uh, invests in a variety of different com companies uh, as a way of providing investment income for maintaining the operations and, you know, maybe providing scholarships for students. Uh, VEU doesn't have that as, you know, being state funded you know, or, or government funded entirely. But, um, you know, I'll go quickly, you know, through this uh, effort in, in Illinois, and, and it, it also reflects uh, pressures on other uh, large investment uh, vehicles, whether it's a pension fund or a, um, a private equity company or whatever, um, you know, big pools of money you know, that are investing in a variety of companies. And, and the, the basic insight is that there's some companies that are out there, you know, with more responsibility for the global climate change, you know, that they're selling products that uh, create a lot of greenhouse gas emissions, that they're not uh, they're, uh, taking actions to help uh, their customers or their communities adapt and they're being you know, um, dishonest with the public about what they're doing. So in 2019, Illinois passed a Sustainable Investing Act you know, that applies to all state and local government entities, you know, including the universities, and you know, says these entities that you should integrate 
sustainability factors uh, into decisions on your investments. And this is how the state treasurer you know, portrays it. You know, that it's a win-win strategy. You get uh, investment benefits and you also get community benefits. Uh, now, the, the again, this, the state treasurer pointed out you know, that uh, this law, you know, has uh, a wide range of sustainability issues, you know, that it encompasses. So some of which are climate, and I put red boxes around too, but a lot of them are in other areas like uh, data security or uh, critical incident risk management, uh, labor practices. You know, so the the... The law didn't specifically say you have to. Oh, hi. Did I lose you or what happened? Uh, yeah, for a second. And we cannot see your screen anymore. Okay, let me try again. In seconds. All right, you're back? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I was just saying that the law covered a wide range of sustainability issues, some of which are climate change, but a lot of them other. Uh, so uh, in you know, at the University of Illinois uh, in 2020, we adopted a climate action plan, and it includes these two specific objectives on divesting from fossil fuels. Uh, at that time, about 1% of the portfolio of the university and its foundation was in coal utility and mining companies. But, you know, as I'll point out later on, it's tricky, you know, because, you know, uh, you know maybe there's an investment in a, uh, a stock index fund, and the uh, the fund might uh, include 500 different companies, and some of the activities of of the company uh, of some of the companies might be a mix of uh, you know, processing fossil fuels as well as you know doing other kinds of um, you know activities on uh, chemical process uh, products or whatever. So characterizing you know the companies as fossil fuel companies or uh, not sustainable companies is is difficult. But you know, you know we got the university in 2020 to adopt these objectives. So uh, in 2021, the university put out a press release saying that it was supporting sustainable investing. You know through uh, these um, uh, uh, funds. Uh, and in 2022, it put out another uh, press release you know, saying that uh, it was supporting innovative businesses on renewable energy and green technology, uh, sustainable food and agriculture, and trying to get away from just focusing in on whether any of its investments in any way touches uh, fossil fuel companies. Uh, but in 2022, later on, you know, there was a, a climate strike at uh, the University of Illinois. And part of the message was to get the university to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, there was a law proposed in uh, 2023 to uh, specifically require you know, state entities, including the state universities, to uh, divest uh, from fossil fuel companies. That didn't get any traction. There was you know, only a handful of co-sponsors and uh, hearings have not been held. So there's, there is a possibility of getting more specific litigation, uh, le sorry, legislation in Illinois on uh, investments by universities and other entities, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. And I just want to point out that, you know, our endowment, you know, is nice. You know, it's, it's a fraction of Harvard's endowment. You know, um, Harvard in 2021 made this statement that he has no direct investments in companies that uh, are on fossil fuels and if viewed it as its responsibility. Uh, but uh, a report came out, you know, on you know the investments uh, a year later, 
you know, claiming, you know, again, it's hard to figure out exactly how you account for some of these investments, but that you know, fossil and fuel investments were had risen, you know, by Harvard in, in that previous year. So, uh, you know, just to, to wrap up, uh, there's a lot of great things that are going on at VAU as, as well as in Illinois. Uh, you know, I was impressed with, you know, the way your recycling looks, uh, you know, the reusable bottles, you know, a lot of uh, students involved in climate strikes or uh, Fridays for climate. And um, uh, you're really feeling like they have to use their voices and to try to get changes in policies um, because their world is not providing them with a healthful uh, environment. So uh, go ahead, ride bicycles, enjoy the outdoors, you know, be a, you know, an uh, model behavior, you know, in terms of low carbon, but also think about other activities that you can be involved in and how you can address climate change. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, Bruce, yeah, I'd love to hear from the uh, students. Yes, we uh, have at least five minutes for questions and comments. I think what we're learning today a little bit too is about something that the U.S. administration today calls a whole of government and whole of a society approach to climate change mitigation. That means using executive, legislative, judicial measures, doing it at the global, federal, state, and local levels, and trying to figure out which can be most effective and which can be most effective quickly because of the urgency that we keep referring to. And in the judicial category, we saw in the United States, in the European Union, a variety of initiatives that have been successful. Sometimes a decision is made and then there's kind of a backlash and it's important uh, to keep pushing uh, to make sure that those who are decision makers know that the people are not satisfied, are not happy and want more action. Let's take some time for some questions and comments from you. Who would like to begin? Maybe I can start with the first question. So that's okay. Yeah, so. Um, Thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, was very insightful. I have a question. So we saw a lot of very big numbers that you presented. Uh, on the one hand, a lot of capital that that is sometimes still in fossil fuels, but then also um, maybe already in sustainable projects. And then on the other side, I as an individual can ride my bicycle to campus. I can use the single, not the single use um, coffee cup, but a uh, um, yeah. Uh, multi-use coffee cup, but that seems very insignificant compared to those big numbers. And what would you say if, so, if some student approaches you and, and tells you about that dilemma? Uh, so, uh, great question. Uh, you know, I, I think that we have to do you know, everything we can. We have to do it on the individual level, you know, because our behaviors, you know, when you know, applied over thousands or millions and hopefully billions of people, you know, do we add up to make a difference? So replacing light bulbs in our homes, you know, with more efficient LED light bulbs or uh, cutting down on, you know, plastics and, and other kinds of steps, you know, do make a difference, right? And um, it makes a difference because, you know, when you know it, it gets multiplied across many people, but it also makes a difference because it it creates a better mindset, and the mindset of caring about the environment and sustainability and climate, you know, is is very important. So, uh, you know, you need to have individual behaviors. You need to vote, and voting is 
uh, you know, something that everybody should be, you know, engaged in. And, and, you know, there are, you know, so many um, opportunities to influence laws at local, regional, national levels. Uh, you know, part of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the reason for the cases you know, that I reported on in Europe you know, is that the legislatures did something but not enough on climate. And you know, if the individuals who cared enough you know, to bicycle and to um, uh, cut down on energy consumption in their homes, voted for representatives who would prioritize uh, climate action, you know, then there wouldn't have been a need to go to the courts, right? Uh, you know, they would have gotten better laws passed. So it starts with the individuals, but it can't stop at the individual behaviors. Uh, we have to take responsibility for influencing other people and uh, hopefully moving laws and court decisions and other programs, business actions and such uh, in a clear direction. Yeah. Other question or comment? Yes, Mr. Benstein. Um, we talked a lot about uh, different court cases which were being brought across the U.S. and the EU and To me, it seems very much like it's a, more the stick than the carrot, let's say. Um, and looking forward, how do you get more of an enticing, more carrot approach, so to speak, to make to changing the world for a better place, like, um, mitigation, mitigating climate change? Um, because just penalizing companies and so on uh, might not be nice. You know, it's not, as I said, you need to get votes right. uh, often. That's right. Really right. Um, so, uh, you know, as your professor said, uh, it's a whole of government and really a whole of society approach. So, uh, uh, in the United States, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency made headlines in the past week by describing a $20 billion green bank you know, where the federal government is providing low interest loans to companies that are doing innovative work on clean energy. Uh, we're providing you know, billions of dollars you know, to uh, support uh, wind and solar installations and uh, home weatherization and um, you know, cleaner uh, manufacturing processes and such. So I agree with you, you know, that uh, we need to, you know, think about, you know, this transition to a green economy as a tremendous economic opportunity where we're creating jobs, you know, we're, um, um, stimulating uh, innovation, uh, it were, uh, great profit opportunities uh, for businesses, um, and you know government programs sh should support that and incentivize it. Uh, but uh, you know, we we have to use all of the tools, you know, including. Uh, you know, holding companies responsible for the harms that they've created and uh, uh, getting uh, businesses to uh, disclose you know, the, uh, their emissions and other uh, harmful behaviors uh, and, and uh, take responsibility for it. So, um, thank you very much for the presentation and for describing all the interesting court cases to us. Um, when you look at these court cases, um, is there any field that you think is underrepresented in these court cases? Anything that surprises you? And where will you think there is a lot of potential in the future to have more of that represented at courts? with a long-term goal of a juster and fairer society, also in the sense of climate change mitigation? So look, that's 
you know, great question. Um, I think the court cases against governments are largely symbolic, right? That you know, they you know, are a way of communicating uh, a commitment to addressing climate change and framing climate action as a human right. And you know, that's important. Uh, there, there are filings that were just made uh, last month with the International Court of Justice to try to get the that court, uh, you know, at the request of the UN General Assembly, to issue an advisory opinion on uh, the legal basis in a variety of different conventions for climate responsibility of of uh, nations. So you know, all of that can be helpful. Uh, holding the fossil fuel companies or the meatpacking companies responsible for uh, harms from climate change, um, I, th I think is encouraged by, you know, the liability of cigarette manufacturers and some of the opioid um, pharmaceutical companies and such. And uh, it's worth trying that litigation, uh, but I think that the the faster track with regard to businesses is on fraud or failure to disclose. You know where you know a company would claim that you know it's taking actions to reduce its greenhouse gases or the impact of its products, and in fact, it's not. Um, those are easier cases to win, and they could have a big impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. We hope you can stay a little longer. It looks as though our next presenters are ready to join us. And I want to say as we conclude again, that uh, it seems as though we're looking at a whole of government, a whole of society approach, and we're looking for best practices, those that can accelerate climate change mitigation best. And in some cases, it's not either executive or legislative or judicial in the regulatory category, but it's all of the above. And in some cases, uh, effective mix. We're going to see from uh, the students from the University of Illinois, too, that uh, they are considering a variety of tools, including legislative tools. We're just going to take a two-minute break now to stretch a little bit. We're going to uh, get them on board, and then we're going to continue. Thank you very much, Warren. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, at least for me. Good morning to you, and it is good afternoon for us here in Vienna. We are going to uh, start in a, another minute or so. Are you expecting Danica to join us also? Yes, yes. I. Uh, oh, there she is, it sounds like. And I have granted you the co-host access and we'll do the same for Danica. Okay, listen. Danica, did you did you hear that? No, sorry. Good mo good morning to you. It's good afternoon to us here in Vienna. We have just completed uh, an hour of information and ideas, questions with uh, Professor Warren Levy from the University of Illinois. And we're just stretching for a minute now before we uh, transition to you and your presentation. Uh, we know that not everyone gets up at 8.30 
in the morning on campus at the University of Illinois. And we'd like to thank you very much. As I understand it, you both have courses this morning. So we'll try to use uh, your time efficiently. With that in mind, I'm going to say that uh, the University of Illinois is a place where there is a robust uh, system for student organizations. They're called RSOs, Registered Student Organizations. And some of them have a longer and greater history. And one of them is the Students for Environmental Concerns. Uh, I have learned a little bit about their work from abroad because although I'm a University of Illinois teacher, I have spent most of my time teaching here in Vienna. And I have seen their tables on what is called the Quad at the University of Illinois and seen their uh, work online. I've also attended uh, one online event with them in the fall of 2023. And I'm very grateful that uh, the current president who is a senior at the University of Illinois and the current vice president who is a junior at the University of Illinois? Correct. One of the virtues of this organization is that the leadership team has representatives from uh, all of the classes. And that uh, is very important so that when someone graduates, there are others who are there to fill the shoes and take over. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much again and indicate that the floor is yours. And we have started the recording. Uh, thank you very much for permitting us to record what you have to say to us today. Danica, hello. Hello. I'll just introduce myself first and then give it to Rudy, but yeah, I'm Danica Ford. I'm a senior studying natural resources and environmental sciences at U of I. Um, and I've been with SCCS for four years and I'm the president this year. So I'm really grateful for this club and all the opportunities it's given me. And I'm really grateful to serve as the president for my final year. Yeah. And my name is Rudy Lefebvre. Uh, I'm a junior studying agricultural and consumer economics. Uh, I'm the vice president here, and I was actually recently elected the student body president of the University of Illinois. So if you've got a problem about campus, bring it up with me. Uh, but Denica and I, and, you know, Denica might start sharing this the screen here pretty soon. Um, Denica and I are going to be talking about uh, fossil fuel divestment, which is something you may or may not have heard of, but is a huge issue here on campus um, and has just been one thing. Uh, in a facet of many that SECS has really been putting our time into um, and really pushing the University of Illinois to change. Um, and as far as I understand, is a huge, huge part of their Illinois Climate Action Plan in making our campus more sustainable. Uh, uh, on the slide here, as it's coming up, there we hold a semesterly climate strike that we'll get into and explain a little bit later. Um, and it is always a blast, always a good amount of people to turn up. Um, yeah, yeah, here we go, here are some pictures. Um, just to kind of get you guys acquainted with everything. You, as you'll see moving forward, divestment has two colors, black and dark, uh, like a deep or a, a bright orange. So with that, let's move on. Context about this. Now, uh, some of you may or may not know what a, what a college endowment is. Um, it is essentially a rainy day fund of, fund of sorts for the university to essentially make sure that staff is paid, that scholarships are able to be paid for, and that the university can function some when occasionally there are down years. And the University of Illinois has two. And, you know, we're going to, uh, I'm going to say the UIS and the UIF. So the UIS, the University of Illinois system, is public money. And the amount invested in fossil fuels totals some $120 million. We are, some, we are talking no small change. This university is actively taking a part in this climate crisis. And the second one is the University of Illinois Foundation. This is a private, nonprofit entity separate from the University of Illinois system that aids in the, aids in the fundraising and aids in the funds being able to be used by the University of Illinois. So there's just going to be two, UIS and UIF. Now, as I was saying about context, 
Students on this campus have been fighting for divestment for over a decade and a half. This movement goes back all the way to 2008 when the movement for Beyond Coal started and then eventually got integrated into Students for Environmental Concerns. Now we normally bring this up because we wanna uh, kind of illustrate where we have been as students. You know, again, I say we started in 2008, but there has been many events unfolding since. You know, some notable ones being from the uh, University of Illinois uh, Senate faculty passed a resolution, I believe it was in 20, uh, 2016, and maybe another one in 20, 2017, possibly, um, essentially calling on the university to divest, uh, I think from what was then just coal. Uh, and the great thing is the university has since divested from coal. I believe something like 99% of their portfolio um, is, is out of coal and utilities or coal and coal utilities. Um, in 2019, another another big event happened when students voted um, to divest this university in a student referendum. In no way was this binding, um, but it you know of the students that voted, north of 75% voted to divest this university. You know, we are making it clear to the university administration that this is an issue that students care about and that the length of this longevity of this uh, program on this campus is something that SCCS is integrally uh, a part of here. Something of note too, uh, 2020, this is one of our biggest arguments yet against the University of Illinois. They actually promised to divest, which, which is kind of crazy. Uh, it was in the Illinois Climate Action Plan uh, version 2020. It's a big, fat booklet, uh, essentially, of non-binding promises and plans the university makes to be net neutral by the year 2050. And in, and in Objective 9.1, the university promises to divest from fossil fuels by fiscal year 2025. And let me tell you here and now, that is unfortunately not going to happen. Um, as we said earlier, the University of Illinois system, the public money, still holds $120 million roughly invested in fossil fuel companies. Uh, the University of Illinois Foundation holds about $110 million. Unfortunately, and due to a variety of reasons, the University of Illinois is not going to divest. They are not going to take this step, uh, especially if we don't continue uh, to pressure them in the way that we have been going on so far. So just for clarification, when we say fossil fuel company, we mean any company that profits from the extraction, refinement, sale, or transport of hydrocarbons, uh, just as like a, a definition aside. But what is fossil fuel divestment? Well, in this scenario, it is removing all of the financial resources we have in our endowments uh, from companies, again, that profit from the extraction, refinement, sale, and transport of fossil fuels. Um, this is actually kind of just one part of our three-part demand. Uh, number one being to divest our endowment systems from fossil fuel companies. The second to dissociate from fossil fuel companies. Um, the most notable one example that I can remember off the top of my head is Chevron. The oil company Chevron sponsored the sustainability award at the engineering open house. You know, if we think about our university as, as a place where we go to solve the world's problems, I think it's pretty interesting that the Chevron oil company is is sponsoring the sustainability board. I think we as a university should have to think. But second, or I'm sorry, but thirdly, you know, we need to decarbonize our um, our campus. We emit something in the fiscal year 2023. We admitted something like 312,000 tons of metric ton uh, of metric greenhouse gases. Um, and quite honestly, if we're going to be net zero by 2050, we need to do a lot more. Yeah, so I'll chime in and kind of talk about why divestment is important. So removing that, those financial investments, removing that social license, kind of making the fossil fuel company not an integral part of our campus is going to uplift and promote clean energy sources for long-term sustainability, which is ultimately something that should be really important to all of us, right? Um Furthermore, it's going to reshape legislation on global carbon emissions to phase out fossil fuels. So removing ourselves from that industry um, and putting in place legislation that is going to make our campus a greener place is obviously something that we need to do to reduce our emissions. Um, this is also really important because according to the World Meteorolog Meteorological Organization, um, in August 2023, we were already above 1.5 degrees Celsius 
um, pre-industry level. So it's really important that we do this as soon as possible. And just kind of as an overall sentiment, these companies are polluting our air, stealing land from indigenous communities and disproportionately harming marginalized communities. So this movement is about bringing people together to protect our earth essentially. Yeah, so kind of what is the University of Illinois' role in fossil fuel divestment? So obviously Rudy touched on earlier that the public endowment of our university currently has $120 million invested in fossil fuels, which equates to 66,299 metric tons of CO2. And this is just from the fossil fuel companies that were invested in as of fiscal year 2022. And just as kind of like an equivalent number that is more like easy to understand, um, that's the same as 14,754 gasoline powered vehicles being driven for one year. And as you can also kind of see from this financed emissions tree chart, Fossil fuel companies only make up 12% of the university's public investments. However, they are responsible for 78% of the financed emissions. So that is a very alarming statistic. Um, they make up such a small portion. These investments make up such a small portion of our investments. So it would be a really easy to just get rid of those 12% and then reduce our finance emissions by 78%. That is very big to me. Um, and you can see some of the bigger companies that our university has money um, invested in, such as BP, Ameren, G&W, Electric. Um, and we'll get to, this is actually from a online database that our club helped create, which I'll get to a little bit later at the end, but yeah. Something Rudy was touching on earlier is that our campus actually has a climate action plan called the ICAP. The Illinois Climate Action Plan is the university's strategic sustainability plan. So just a bunch of list of goals in hopes of achieving net zero um, by 2050. However, this is a non-binding agreement. So it really just is a bunch of goals. There's no way for this to be legally binding in any way <laughs> yeah boo um and it is updated every five years so that's good um that we're renewing it and adding new goals but it is ultimately non-binding and objective 9.1 of the latest version of the ICAP we did agree to divest all holdings from fossil fuel companies by fiscal year 2025 obviously that's not happening however we as students are trying to hold the university accountable with the UIS Fossil Free Divestment Act, which we'll get into a little bit here. Um, and just kind of as a final note, you, the UIUC basically has no intention of creating a binding agreement to divest, nor is it starting negotiations. So this is kind of something we've had to keep the university accountable on with ourselves as students. Yeah, so a little bit more background um, on just sustainable investing in general. So the Sustainable Investing Act um, is an act that was spearheaded by Treasurer Ferrix in 2019 and signed into law with an effective date for 2020. And ultimately, this act provides that all state and local government entities that hold and manage public funds should integrate material relevant and useful sustainable factors into their policies, processes, and decision-making. So the kind of question we're kind of asking is, is the University of Illinois truly complying with this act if it continues to invest in fossil fuel companies? Oops, I'm on mute. Um, now this is the part where I'm gonna kind of dive in here because I think that, you know, as, as I've been learning recently, this is sometimes the most important argument. This is the most pertinent argument. This is the most um, convincing argument, I think, to a lot of people, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of policymakers here and around the world. Now, uh, lessons from the in retirement industry. 
Uh, I know this is something that, at least for us students, is a little far away, but this is important context, right? Because a lot of the time we have some of the largest pension systems investing hundreds of millions of dollars in fossil fuel companies. Um, and there are many examples of why this can go wrong. Uh, pension systems funds would have been 13% higher if not invested in energy sectors, uh, the energy sector from 2013 to 2022. You know, the most notable point about this being that the energy market weighs down larger and and more profitable sections of our of our indexes. You know, these companies, like, let's think about this for a second. These companies' profits almost solely rely on the sale, uh, the sale and price difference in crude oil markets, right? If for whatever reason there were to be a dip, there were to be a, a price change, these companies' profitability varies significantly. Even according to the S&P 500's SEC filings, fossil fuel companies hold two times the risk in volatility because of this. You know, if you were to go back into like the 1980s, fossil fuel companies would have been a much different long term investment. But we must seriously consider now, considering the way that the, the, the at least the at least uh, excuse me, the United States is going in at least the way in the world is which going. If we're looking towards a low carbon economy, in what way do these fossil fuel companies have a, have a place to expand? In what way are we thinking as a long term investment? Are these companies going to be able to be a part of our economy more. And that's something that when we think about retirement funds, which are, which are definitely long-term, um, you kind of start to see, right? Uh, and it, just as another example to kind of really pinpoint this, six major U.S. retirement funds would have been worth a combined $21 billion more today than if they had divested from the energy sector a decade ago. Uh, NVIDIA, I think, has the market cap as the same entire industry, energy industry, like one company. So it's like we really as a society have already started to see shifts in the way that our economics work behind this. And it's time to be able to start really putting that into action. Now, I touched on this earlier about the S&P um, and about our energy, the energy volatility weighing down these stocks in the long term. But you can see this out right here. Um, I, th I do believe this is the S&P 500. Um, and when you see the different uh, tracks here going on, we have to really think about this as a university, at, at least specifically case specific. You know, we hold and we are aiming towards uh, a longer term investment so that the University of Illinois can continue to function. You know, in what way are these companies positioned to do well in a low carbon economy? You know, they're spending 1% of their budgets per year uh, on decarbonization when we think of like agro agrofuels and stuff like that. But we must like seriously ask the question how, you know, even from this financial standpoint, how are how is Chevron, how is BP going to be positioned well in the long term low carbon future that is that will be our world economy? And it's unfortunate that we, you know, have to take this take this economic side um especially when talking to administrators in continuing conversations about divestment. But one thing that we have been learning about is that this is a defensive, at this point, divestment is a defensive measure to protect our endowments. Considering where the, where the entire world is headed in green energy, we must seriously consider whether or not these companies have, are profitable or are relevant in the long-term solution that is decarbonizing our world. Yeah, so I'm going to jump back in here and talk a bit about how does this affect Illinoisans, people at the university, um, just as a whole. So Illinois can be a pioneer in legislation against climate change through divesting um, our flagship university. We are well a well-known university around the world. Us divesting sends a major statement to other universities across the U.S. and even across the globe. So this is something we really need to consider in terms of being a leader and being the pioneer that we claim to be in the sustainability field. Um, furthermore, the U of I is a massive draw for the state as a whole, but every day that it denies commitment to sustainability, we fall behind. There are other universities across the U.S. that have divested and are actively making plans to divest and not just simply making the promise. And so every day that we're not working on that, we're falling behind essentially. Um, and lastly, we owe it to future generations to have the same opportunities to enjoy Illinois and this university 
as we have. And if we keep investing in companies, especially in the fossil fuel industry, we are not ensuring that they will have those same opportunities. Now, what are we doing to divest? This is just uh, one example of how we're moving forward, but this has been an awesome experience that I have been leading uh, and I'm excited to share a little bit about it. This is House Bill 5268. This is quite literally a student-led bill to divest our university. Um, it is a, essentially it is a addendum to the University of Illinois Act um, in which it state mandates what our board of trustees has to do. COVID-19 pay time off, which campuses they have to visit and when, who gets voting rights, all of that is in the University of Illinois Act. This bill is an addendum to that, basically stating that within the roles and responsibilities of the Board of Trustees, one of those roles and responsibilities is to divest. And man, oh man, has this been an awesome opportunity? Has this been an awesome project? Um, there's been a couple of folks from SECS who joined me in lobbying in Springfield, our capital here. Um, and we're actually in that process. We found out the University of Illinois is like actively lobbying against us. Like th think about that for a second. The University of Illinois is actively lobbying against its students. The like, U of I is going and reversing back on its promise to divest. Um, and the whole reason why we even had to take this route in the first place is because we don't feel listened to. If we submit a comment at the Board of Trustees meeting, the Board of Trustees is the, are the group of people who essentially control our investments. We submit a comment and we get ignored. What else are we going to do? We protest every semester and we are largely not listened to or, or reacted to by the administration. How else do we go about this other than over the university's head? And this has been an awesome process. We are by no means done. This HP 52 with 68 actually got put into a higher ed committee uh, and then into a subcommittee. Um, and unfortunately, because of the way that it happened, it was like in the later half of the year and we didn't have enough time to seriously sit down with legislatures and um, start to really talk about passing this legislation. But think about this. This is like a David and Goliath scenario. This is a student led bill divesting our university after we have probably for the last decade and a half, you know, never had as much leverage as we do now over the university administration. And I'll tell you what, they are scared. If they're lobbying against it, they are they are, their alarms are raised. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, this has been a super cool um, experience for students in our group to get involved directly with policy and legislation. And it's just been really awesome to see this project unfold. Um, And so kind of looking forward to our next steps, we are going to continue working to pass HB 5268. And that kind of includes continuing to get bill sponsors um, in the Illinois Senate and House of Representatives, and also doing more coalition building over the summer with important groups such as the Illinois Sierra Club and the Illinois Environmental Council, which have both um, been very helpful in this process and been very um, supportive. And we are continuing to apply pressure to the University of Illinois administration. Um, we're currently planning our next climate strike that's happening in two less than two weeks at this point. So we're actively still applying that pressure. Um, we're also connecting with other campuses throughout the state in solidarity to get support on this as well. Um, and as I said, continuing to host our semesterly climate marches strikes to call on the university to divest. Um, and we are also working to add a student referendum next year to allow students to vote on this issue again, because the last time was in 2019. So that was quite a few years ago at this point. Um, so that's definitely a big goal for us as well. And then this is just a little bit about how you all could get involved. Um, we have some QR codes up here. The top one is a petition to divest the U of I system from fossil fuels. So that's a really great way that you can help us um, in a very quick way. Um, a more committed way is um, if you all are here on campus at some point, um, joining our club. We meet um, at the Channing Murray Foundation every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30. 
We're also very active on social media, so you can follow us on Instagram to stay up to date on any events or information that we post. Furthermore, you can call on your state representatives to co-sponsor our bill. Um, that's something we're really going to be pushing hard for, especially in this next um, voting cycle. Also organizing in your local community to push for environmental um, efforts and some great groups for this are Sunrise, Fridays for Future. There's a college climate network um, with students across the US. So there's a lot in Big Ten schools as well that come together on issues such as this. And then also just spreading information to your peers. Word of mouth is very important on issues like this and it's a great way for us to gain support. So whatever you can do to help spread the word is also very appreciated. Um, and I didn't touch on this, but the bottom link takes you directly to the Illinois General Assembly website where the bill is posted um, and it shows updates for the bill and stuff like that. Anything else you want to add, Rudy? Before there might I be there might be something about Taurus on the inside. I don't know if you're getting to that next. Yes. Okay. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, um, but our group essentially created a an online database called the Transparent and Open Resource for Institutional Investments. And so this is just to show a visual um, representation of our university's public investments. So you can check out this QR code or just go to taurus.earth um, and you can look around. There's a lot of really good information on there. There's requests, um, different responses to pushback. There's just good arguments for divestment. And then you can actually see the numbers of how much we're invested in certain companies um, if you're interested in stuff like that. And lastly, this is just like an <laughs> overall um, QR code. This is probably the most important one because I think this one has links to basically all the other QR codes that I've put before it, but this is just our overall organizational link tree um, that can be found in our Instagram bio. Um, but yeah, if you scan this, it takes you to our Instagram, takes you to all the other QR codes that I showed you earlier. So yeah, do we have any questions? We sure do, but uh, before, we take those questions. I want to say that uh, we have had presentations from uh, United Nations Paris Agreement leaders, from EU Commission leaders, from Austrian economic experts, and from many others. And the presentation you just gave, along with the Warren Levy presentation in the previous hour, are among the best we have had. I'd like to compliment all of you. I feel as though we have learned a lot and I really like that approach of providing information, talking about next steps, and also letting us know how we can get involved. Thank you very much. And having said that, now I'd like to turn the camera back to the audience. We have uh, several University of Illinois students here, and I just happened to notice that they, they were taking shots of the QR codes, and uh, I have the sense that they get back on campus that if they aren't engaged already, they may be thinking about it seriously. Let's uh, take questions and comments, whatever you'd like to say, who would like to go first? And I think it doesn't have to be one of us up here. Go for it. Yes, please uh, identify yourself with your name and where you come from. My name is Bobby and I come from Hungary. I'm just wondering what, why there is this big obstacle between the university actually wanting to just de divest from fossil fuels. Is it a knowledge gap or are there certain important actors in there that are really resisting this change because they're benefiting a lot from it? I just don't really understand why that is. Yeah, that is a, that is a fundamental question that we have been dealing on dealing with on campus. Unfortunately, as most things in this world, it comes back to money. Um, 
I think between the years 2013 and 2023, we took in as a university something something in the realm of $106 million, something in the low hundreds of millions of dollars from BP. Um, this money was used for, most of this money was used for research. Um, we're a big agriculture school. Uh, we're out in the Midwest, so it's like all about corn and soy. Um, and a lot of that money was going towards research funding um, for these different agrobiofuels. But I think that just highlights the relationship that our university has with fossil fuel companies. You know, uh, two of our board of trustees, two, I think out of seven or nine, come from fossil fuel corporations previously. Um, it's really unfortunate to see a, real, a, a huge higher education institution so embedded with fossil fuel companies. And we take in, we take in huge sums of money through donorship uh, from fossil fuel companies. And ultimately, I think the biggest the biggest answer to that is just that we have previously had relationships with fossil fuel companies. We have previously taken in donor money, and it is quite something to uproot that and to and to get the university to kind of ignore that relationship or to kind of get rid of that relationship, um, even though there's evidence to say that divestment doesn't do that. So, yeah, that and answers I'll, your question. I'll kind of pitch in here too a little bit. We also. I think it's honestly just they truly part of them believes that it is the most economically benefit to stay invested in these companies as well. Um, I don't know that they want to take the risk of investing in green energy yet. So I think, yeah, <laughs> so I think that's a big thing. There's also worries about creating bad relationships with um, fossil fuel companies for the sake of graduate jobs they try to say like oh we're going to be make our graduates less desirable to these companies if we don't support them if we cut ties with them um and they also try to say that they're like the good investors like oh we're gonna use our and in, like investments as to be good stakeholders in this company and like help them become more sustainable but are they really acting on that i don't think so so Hopefully that answers your question. It's a wide range of issues, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. I'm not going to name other companies, but I do want to mention that at the University of Illinois, the relationship uh, to agribusiness is very important. And there's a city down the road, a little bit Decatur, Illinois. And if you look to see what company has uh, big headquarters there. It also helps you to put two and two together. That's only one example. I think that, uh, what Rudy and Danica just mentioned is important, and it's important for us as we try to think outside the box to figure out how to change the behavior of uh, the University of Illinois. I want to say that uh, one of the uh, lines of argument is what is economically most favorable? Rudy outlined that very well. Also, there is a question about reputation. And the University of Illinois compares itself to other universities that have divested. And uh, it, the University of Illinois, wants to always say that it is either among the best or is the best. And challenging that narrative is also something that can be influential. Other questions and comments? Um, I'm a student from U of I, just your first semester, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the protests that you have at every or strengths, what you said every semester, and how we could get involved in those on the campus. Yeah, so we have Semesterly climate strikes usually in the fall, they're in either September or October. Um, and then in the spring semester, they're always in April at some point. Um, we are actually having our upcoming one on Earth Day itself, which is Monday, April 22nd. And we are starting at 1230. We usually post all these details on our Instagram. So that's definitely like the best way to get involved and to keep up to date. So definitely scan the link tree and follow us on Instagram. But we usually meet up at Alma Mater. Um, we disseminate a lot of our posters that the club makes to 
locals that come to other students that don't have a poster. Um, we bring a ton of banners. We have some megaphones. Um, and essentially, we usually walk from Alma to Follinger and then Follinger to Swanlin Administration, which is where a lot of the higher ups, like the chancellor, um, that is the building where they would be usually if they're on campus. And then we go back down Green Street, back to Alma. And all along um, that, that path, we have speakers. Um, we stop for speakers and just we have a bunch of chants that we go through. But yeah, the best way to get involved or just to know about it is probably our Instagram or joining our Discord. But yeah, Rudy, do you want to add anything else? The one thing I will say is that it is the one time, well, the one out of two times or two times a year, because we do fall and spring, that I get to lose my voice for a good reason. So love losing my voice. Get on the microphone, do your thing. Uh, it's, it's a really fun time. It's also like, when have you, when's the last time any of us were part of a protest or like publicly showcasing our voice? Um, and it's great that we do these semi-regularly. So it's a great opportunity to come out. Professor Levy has uh, joined us again. He's on screen. And I'd like to ask a question for all three of you. The University of Illinois has uh, an Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and the Environment, I see. I understand that uh, each University of Illinois student uh, pays a fee each semester uh, to fund that organization's activities. And that means that also students have a seat at the table making decisions about how the funds are used. Can uh, you tell us a little bit how that works at the University of Illinois? If you think it's good enough, uh, if there's room for improvement, how does it look? Yeah, so um, we do have the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Environment on campus. Um, however, we have the Green Fund is called the Student Sustainability Committee. And so, yeah, we pay, I think, around $18. Each student pays around $18 each semester, I want to say. Um, and it goes into that fund. So they have like about $1.5 million to give away every year. And that money is given away to student or faculty-led projects um, that are related to sustainability. So it, you're, you're right. We definitely do act as a stakeholder in that sense um, that students have a say, students can apply for to use that money. Um, and students actually are on the board to decide how that money is disseminated. So that board is made up of students. Um, so they are actively having a say in how the money is distributed and who is receiving it. Um, it's been used for cool projects such as it helped build the new campus instructional facilities, geothermal system. Um, it helps with bike infrastructure on campus. Um, they help support a lot of things. So I think it is a really great opportunity for students to be able to utilize that money for sustainability efforts on campus. But yeah, anyone I'm else? Gonna, I'm going to jump in here and say that at the very least, to some degree, personal, and I and I think we as students have a little bit of a kind of a standoffish relationship with the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and the Environment. Um, and the reason why I say that, and Danica, you might be able to speak more to this, but we recently student student environmental leaders on campus recently had a meeting with the director uh, with the new director of the IC, the, the this organization we're talking about, um, and divestment came up. Um, and it unfortunately doesn't look like a, a new promise to divestment will be in the 2025 version of the Illinois Climate Action Plan. Um, and I think previously we've tried to get help from them to some degree. And, you know, they're kind of at the whim of the university administration. So it's like it's it's a bit of politicking going on. Um, but I think outside of divestment, we have a pretty good relationship. No, I just want to add that uh, there, there are two separate 
um, efforts. You know, as Danica correctly said, there's a green fund that's supported by the student fees and under the control of the Student Sustainability Committee. And then the, the Institute has kind of its own foundation funding as well as university monies. It's, it's not supported by the student fees. Uh, I've been on campus now for 12 years. Both of them, uh, both these initiatives are a lot stronger, you know, than they were 12 years ago. You know, the Student Sustainability Committee, you know, it got a lot of energy for the students. They're doing a much better job now in evaluating policy uh, projects and following up on their implementation and a lot of great students involved. The Institute is, you know, what, it was created, what, about eight or 10 years ago, and, you know, it adds to the campus. There, there's room for improvement on both of them uh, that um, uh, my uh, biggest concern about both is not what they're doing, but, you know, that most students don't even know about you know, either one, you know, that uh, they don't know you know, is it, you know, eighteen dollars, you know, per semester. You know, it, it, it's real money for a lot of students, especially the ones who are working, you know, their way, you know, through the college. And you know, the the uh, uh, the institute, you know, putting out its climate action plan and such for the, you know, signed off by the chancellor. You know, that should be something that the students are familiar with. But my experience with undergraduates and my courses and other, you know, is that. Uh, you get some, you know, superstars like Danica and Rudy, you know, who kind of live and breathe this and, you know, are, are um, uh, spreading the enthusiasm, you know, but, you know, whether it's 95% of the students or, you know, they, they're they good people, but they just don't understand, don't know about either of these activities. So I, I wish that there was, you know, more of a connection with more students. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, that kind of begs the question about how one can mobilize the University of Illinois student body uh, more effectively. And maybe we could have that be a final question from our side to uh, sounds as though uh, the Students for Environmental Concerns has a pretty comprehensive uh, tool chest to do that, and uh, do you have ideas for doing it more effectively? Do you think the University of Illinois faculty and administration ought to be doing a better job? What do you think? I I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I think that the faculty here at U of I is is quite awesome. Um, I know they have I know personal members myself who have um, really helped me. Um, and I think a lot of the time, lower level administrators uh, in the university are actually for divestment, um, at least specifically when we talk about, you know, expanding and mobilizing campus. Um, but I think the number one way that we do that, um, at least as students for environmental concerns with these climate strikes, is we need to bridge connections between a whole range of RSOs on campus. Um, I think we just need to collaborate you know, I myself and Danica have put in a lot of time like making and growing these new collections, connections between different organizations. And ultimately, I think that's how we move forward. I think that's how we amplify everyone's message is that, you know, we come to understand how intersectional environmentalism is, whether that be with, you know, uh, economic equality or uh, racial and ethnic equality. Um, we come to understand that the world that we live on is the basis um, for which we move forward with everything else. Uh, and I think the way we do that, the way we mobilize further is by partnering and working together with other progressive orgs on campus, other environmental orgs on campus, and ultimately, hopefully, start to have a conversation, a real honest and truthful conversation about divestment, about sustainability on campus with the Board of Trustees, with higher level administrators. All right. We're looking at the clock a little bit then as instructors, we have another item or two to discuss uh, before we end our instruction today. I want to thank you again very much. I think there are University of Illinois students here 
who are coming back to campus and want to get involved. There also are some Austrian students coming for a semester abroad. It's happening every semester. And we're uh, trying to direct them more and more to bring stories about best practices and also their energy to campus for a semester. Look for some more activity like that. And we wish you the best of luck as you move through the rest of this semester and on to uh, next year and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to stop our recording here.